love that and I love this chorus too. It says, the king is coming. Sing it with me. The king is coming. The king is coming. I just heard the trumpet sounding. And now his face I see. good singing. We're going to sing a wonderful old hymn here. Blessed Assurance. Jesus is mine. I want you to lift your voice. We're going to sing three verses of this wonderful song. Here we go. Blessed Assurance. Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Day of salvation. Purchase of God. Lord of His grace. sing the next verse. I wanted to play that through. Make sure you shake hands. Will you do that please? Crosby would be upset, but we probably should praising my Savior all year long, right? That's what we want to do. I want to sing a couple of verses of this wonderful song. It says, Jesus, we just want to thank you. He has been so good to us all of the time. This has been a banner year for the Yellow River Baptist Church. Let's sing this as our form of worship this morning. Jesus, we just want to thank you. Jesus, we just want to thank you. So 
good to see everyone here this morning, visitors. I know we got a number of visitors here. Thank you for being here in our service this morning. We got a lot of our own folks out. Uh, most importantly, Big Jerry, who is normally here, uh, is not feeling well. He's under the weather, as is a lot of our folks, just not feeling well. And I know they'd love to be here. My guess is Jerry is probably watching this morning. Don't critique what I just did, Jerry, leading this singing, okay? Uh, but he's not feeling well. Just a lot of people. If I, I just can't name the names. And uh, it's kind of under the weather. You pray for them, if you will. And uh, uh, just uh, uh, pray for those that are, we got a lot of folks traveling here with the holidays yet. And uh, a lot of things going on. But it's good to see you here this morning. Been looking forward to this day of being in the house of the Lord. Brother Mark's going to come and give us some prayer requests, some things to be praying about. And then Brother Joe, I want you to open us in prayer, if you will. But uh, before he does, uh, I'm not sure if you get, did everyone get what you wanted to get for Christmas? Did you? All right, let's see your hand there. Oh boy, a lot of folks are going into this next year saying I didn't get what I wanted. I can tell you two people who got what they wanted, and that is Austin Davis and Allie Jones. On December 25th, they got engaged, and we are so excited for them. That's how they, they will never forget uh, on the December 25th, 2014, uh, getting engaged. I am so excited for them. Could not find two finer, finer young Christian people. Uh, obviously, the Lord has brought them together, but what I would tell Austin as he could not be marrying into a family with better in-laws with Steve and Laura, I tell you. And uh, Allie, you, you, you cat, the two finest in Mark and Kathy, I'm telling you. And we are so excited. Here comes Steve right now. Steve, I'm talking about what a great father-in-law you're going to be. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but I'm excited for them. And you make sure you get around, give them a hug and, uh, uh, and uh, tell them you're excited for them. And uh, those are the types of things I like to hear about at Christmas time. So, uh, but with that, Brother Mark, you come give us some prayer requests with them. Brother Joe, you open us in prayer, please. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Kathy and I are absolutely thrilled. Uh, I'm thrilled that's one more off the payroll. And, <laughs> and I am thrilled to have Allie as a daughter. And uh, we, we could not be happier, and we praise the Lord for that. But I also want to say thanks to all of you, because you have made an impact on both of them. And uh, they speak often about the church and serving the Lord here for many years to come. And I appreciate the influence that you have had on both of my boys. Uh, and now, in this case, my daughter-in-law. So thank you daughter-in-law-to-be, I guess. I can't claim her just yet, but uh, she's been eating at my house enough to be my daughter. So, no. Actually, it's just reverse. I think he's wearing Steve out. But, uh, but we are absolutely, absolutely thrilled. Let me share some names with you here. Continue to pray for Richard Cochran and Charles Moore, Rick Helms, all of these fellows recuperating from surgeries. They're all doing well, but it's just a lengthy and so pray for all of them. If you would, pray for Janet Thomas. If you were not here last Sunday, Janet had surgery actually on Christmas Eve, was able to go home Christmas Day. She is at home recovering. And then pray for Jimmy Davis, if you would, in the uh, passing of Juanita, and obviously the hurdles that are in front of him with that. Pray for Jimmy, if you would. And then John Helms mentioned and asked that we pray for Carol Helms' father. That is Roy uh, Forgy. He is in the hospital at Gwinnett Medical Center with some uh, abdominal issues. John asked this morning that we would pray for him. So if you would remember Carol Helm's father, if you would. Let's pray. Our God in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much Lord, for today, Lord, for what this time of the year means to us. Father, thank you, Lord, that through your love and through, through your son, Lord, that we have uh, Lord, access to you, Lord, and we can come to you. Father, we come to you this morning, Lord, with prayer requests. Lord, first of all, thank you for those, Lord, that have been recovering, Lord, for the surgeries that they went through, Lord, as they continue to recover. Lord, we pray that you would, Lord, help that go quickly. We thank you, Lord, for the blessing we heard this morning, Lord, of these two coming to, or wanting to come together, Lord, to honor you with their lives. Father, we do thank you for the influence of our church, Lord, for the love that it, that it has towards one another, for our pastor, for his life. 
But for all those uh, in leadership, Lord, thank you so much for it. We pray, Lord, during this time of the year, Lord, that some may think that, Lord, they're going through things, but, Father, you know what those are. We pray, Lord, that you would help those, Lord, go to you and trust in you. That you would provide them wisdom and grace and comfort through these times. We pray, for Lord, for the prayer request that we mentioned this morning, Lord, uh, for Brother Helms' uh, or Carol's, uh, Lord, parents, Lord, that you would just be with that situation. Father, we do pray, Lord, for our church, for those, again, that are struggling. Lord, we thank you so much, Lord, for your love for us, for your mercy towards us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated, visitors. Again, it is good to have you here. I know folks visiting family from out of town. Good to see Perry and Betty Jane back. We miss them. Perry told me this morning, he said, you know, at 77 years old, he said, it's, it's, you don't get out and around as much as you used to. And I told him, I said, my mom used to tell me, she said, I want to get out and go and do things. And she said, by the time I get ready, I'm so tired, I need to lay down. <laughs> and that's about... The, the way it is, good to see them back and good to see you here this morning. If you were not here Wednesday night, you missed a blessing. We had a Christmas Eve candlelight service. I guess both of these sections were just about full. Uh, but I heard so many comments, and not just about the service, but the testimony. And we'll try to do that again. Brother Jerry, his testimony, Brother Joe's, and then Brother Mark's. It was just a very sweet time that we had. And then we finished with that candlelight, uh, uh, Jesus, the light of the world, and... Uh, and went home but I appreciate everyone who was helping out with that it's difficult as people are traveling and vacations and then sickness falls uh, I appreciate all of the folks that regularly fill in for Nita Jackson here at the piano the Andersons are up in Florida and uh, and the plane was uh, our plane the cockpit back there was going to be flying on automatic pilot today Jim Medley's in Texas uh, Brent Harrison's away uh, the Andersons are away and so Julie Moore was going to be helping Joy, and Julie is sick. And so uh, my son-in-law, Rick, back there, is, uh, and he's not feeling well. And he's back there, and Joy's running the sound. Billy is running the Internet. And uh, we got a whole new crew back there. And I appreciate that. And the, the, the pressure of the day is on my son-in-law to make sure that he gets everything right as I go through my slides here. Trust me, there is pressure on him. He knows that. Uh, but he's not feeling well either, and uh, so. But I appreciate him being here, and it's been good for us to have our family together for Christmas with Heather and Rick here, and Luke, and we have enjoyed grandbaby Luke. We're going to hate to see him go. That crying and wailing you will hear a little bit later this afternoon will be my wife as she is latched on to Luke, <laughs> not wanting him to leave the state of Georgia. But I know is with Heather and Rick and a lot of folks, you pray for safe travel for all of those that will be uh, traveling. But it's, it's good to be in the house. I can't imagine uh, that we've already been through a year. This is the last Sunday here of 2014. Looking forward to next year. I have some things to say about that. But ushers, if you want to get in your place and uh, come forward and take up the offering. It's been an absolute banner year for Yellow River Baptist Church in terms of your faithful giving. Uh, and uh, haven't seen like it, anything like it. And uh, 1871 uh, from the start of this church to the present. And uh, you've allowed this church to do some wonderful things uh, with our missionaries and help others. And uh, I'm thankful for that. We'll have some more to say about that as we get into next year. But uh, you get your tithes and offerings ready and uh, for this uh, morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, I thank you for... Uh, the gracious way in which you have blessed this church. Father, I thank you that we all get excited to worship you, not only just by being here and our, our, through our praise and our songs, but, Father, through that which you have blessed us with. Father, it all comes from your hand. And so, Father, we, uh, we rejoice in having the privilege to just give back a small portion to you. So, Lord, I ask, as I always do, that you would bless those that so sacrificially give. Father, you'd bless the leaders of this church as we gather and we uh, make the right decisions that give you the, the greatest honor and glory through these things that are given. So Father, we uh, pray for our missionaries today. Lord, as they are, many of them are in very difficult, unsafe areas of our world serving you. Father, we pray you could bless them all. Father, you can encourage their spirit. And Father, I thank you that we are, are allowed as a church to have a part in their ministry. But Father, we give this offering to you, for it's in Christ's name we do pray. Amen.
give them a hand. That is a beautiful song. I appreciate uh, just really on short notice and with very little fanfare at all. Uh, and uh, I will do better on that next year in 2015, trust me. But uh, the Christmas offering that you all gave, specifically just that offering uh, in the box out back, was something over $6,000 last week. And uh, a number of prayer requests that went into that. And uh, as I've read through those and looked at them, uh, each day I'll be having five of those prayer requests, as I've been doing since last week and praying about those specifically in addition to other things and another five and I'm going to be praying with those for all those that put those in there that God will do something very special as we unite our hearts in prayer. Uh, I, God, the, the, the prayers of righteous people really avail much and, and uh, it allows me as your pastor, I, 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 I know most of what's going on in the lives of our church, I do that. And, and as you're praying, it's very easy to picture people in your mind and what you're praying for with them. This kind of gets me a little more in tune, I guess, than I've ever been, which I appreciate. And so uh, I'm looking forward to seeing what God is going to do in the lives of our people this year and the life of our church. And I appreciate those who so, uh, again, graciously thought through and prayerfully gave that offering in the back, something different and above and beyond what you would normally do in your ties. And uh, and uh, so, uh, just let me know as God answers prayers and gives an answer to those things for those that put things in there, and, uh, and we'll know how to rejoice and uh, give him the praise for those things. I'd ask Kathy, uh, Brother Mark, uh, Kathy, you can come. Uh, Julie, uh, more, Julie Myers was going to sing this morning and not feeling well, and we were kind of scrambling at the last minute. I know these people that do all of these things with the musicians and other things, uh, hopefully you don't take it for granted because they can make it look real easy uh, by showing up and doing their things and nothing seems to miss a beat and you have no idea um, when you can have a service running seamlessly and the only, only interruptions you want to see in a service is what the Holy Spirit of God makes and those are fine. But what you don't want to have is other interruptions that kind of get you distracted and you have no idea how comforting it is as, as a pastor to have people you can call on who could step in and do things and, and do it seamlessly and do it with that wonderful prayerful heart. And I appreciate Kathy singing this morning. I'm looking at this song she's going to sing. It is a favorite of mine. After she sings, I'm going to give you a message. It's a, Rocket ships don't have rear view mirrors. All right? That's what you're going to hear today. Kathy? Oh. 
isn't that a great thought? You know, we're not, God's not there kind of worried in a huddle with us wondering what's going to happen tomorrow. <laughs> He's just not. He is already there. He knows it. And isn't it great to know that he is going right there with us? Uh, just, uh, it's an amazing thought. Thank you very much, Kathy. Let's have a word of prayer. Our Father, I am so thankful for this tremendous day. Father, for this year, for the culmination of so many wonderful things, Lord. And I thank you for that. Lord, I thank you for the dear people that are here today. I thank you for our visitors and would pray, Lord, they're blessed by what they're experiencing here today. Father, I thank you for the faithful service of so many people in this church, Lord, who uh, just do what they do in serving you with that heart of joy. And Father, do it so well. Uh, Father, I would ask this morning, though, as we're assembled here for this last Sunday of the year, that you would again still our hearts. Father, you would make us attentive to your word. Lord, I know you're here in the midst with us. Uh, your word promises us that. But Lord, I would ask and pray there wouldn't be any disruptions and things that would uh, move our attention away from your word today, from allowing your Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts. And Father, I pray that we would all be encouraged as a result of being in your house today. For it's in Christ's name I do pray. Amen. You may be seated. had a fellow that used to work for me, Dr. Jerry Wilbur, and he wrote his doctoral thesis on, on uh, really business-type issues. And uh, he titled it, Rocket Ships Don't Have Rearview Mirrors. And I'll kind of explain that a little more, but uh, I uh, wanted to steal that from my good friend Jerry Wilbur today. And uh, I'll explain more about that as we get into the message. I guess as we're on the verge of contemplating another year, many people may be wondering what that new year is going to bring. Uh, we always kind of think about that. We, we rethink about the year we've just come through. There'll be all sorts of programs on TV between now and uh, the first of the year, recapping and highlighting some of the major events and all those things. But it seems that people always use this time of year to do one particular thing make resolutions, right? We all kind of get through the year and we get to where we're ready to enter into another year and it always seems a good time to make resolutions. This is what I'm going to do, kind of addressing some personal habits, those things, to try to improve myself for next year. And these are the top six, by the way, as you look at different uh, online things and all of that. These were kind of the culmination of the top six things that people will make resolutions to do next year. Obviously, the first two are pretty obvious, aren't they? Lose weight and to exercise more. Those two are on my list, by the way. All right? Uh, lose weight and exercise more. That's why you see all of the commercials right now this time of year about weight loss and everything else and all the exercise equipment that is out there. And, uh, and they always pick those triathlon athletes to advertise that stuff, don't they? They never grab someone like me to say, would you want to be in this commercial? Uh, but lose some weight, exercise more, quit smoking, which is a good one. A lot of people say, I'm going to draw a line in the sand, and I'm going to try to get past smoking. It was an article I read. I was amazed. I don't know what a price of cigarettes cost. Didn't know how many were in a pack. Found out that there were 25 in a pack. And uh, that, uh, you know, it, the price varies state to state. I think Kentucky has the lowest price for a pack of cigarettes, which is $5. New York City, $14.50. Uh, so uh, all of the state tax, all of the city tax uh, pat put on top of that. And no wonder when you have something like that happen, there's always another market that will surface. And apparently there is a huge black market in New York City, people literally selling individual cigarettes on the sidewalk. Fourteen fifty a pack. I think I quit. <laughs> uh, reduce personal debt. A lot of folks say I got to do that. Quit drinking. I like that one. Find a better job. I don't know if any of those would be on your uh, a list for next year or not, but it's certainly two of them are for me. I'm going to try to exercise more. I'm going to try to lose a little weight. And uh, I think I'll uh, I do, to do some other things, too. Uh, as I mentioned a few Sundays ago, I'm going to spend more time this year studying the Word of God. 
Now, well, normally when you say that, people assume, well, that's because you haven't been doing it, huh? No, I've been spending a lot of time in it. But I've also been spending a lot of other time, a lot of time doing other things that really aren't that important at the end of the day. And I'm going to call some of those things out of my schedule and devote and give more time to the study of the Word of God, which uh, along with that means that I'm not going to allow other people to dictate my schedule at their time frame. Now, a lot of you may know what I'm talking about when I say that, but there are always people that procrastinate and wait or have an opportunity to, to mold a schedule or an event they want to have done that would be in line in, with, with what your schedule would be. Then there are those that just think whenever they plan something, you're going to drop what you're doing and run and do them. I'm not going to do that, okay? Uh, now, there's important things when people are in the hospital and sick and things like that, but when people can plan and uh, help me plan and we can be in kind of harmony with what's going to happen, that works. But uh, the men on this platform and others who have been in the ministry know what I'm talking about. It doesn't happen very often, but uh, you end up putting aside a lot of things that you are very important to you and your family and your life. So I'm going to try to do some adjustment to that. Those are some of my resolutions for this year. But today I want us to focus upon a resolution, a commitment that I believe every Christian should make that I think would make all of us happier, more joyful, have less stress in our life, we'd have a much better outlook on life, uh, and it's not on the resolution list here that we just looked at, but I think all of us could use it and to learn something for it, and uh, so that's what I'm going to talk about this morning. I want you to stick with me. I've wondered how many Christians carried into the year we're in right now, we're ready to finish, 2014. I wonder how many Christians carried into 2014 burdens or hurts or heartaches, poor past decisions, maybe ne negative comments that someone had made to them or about them to someone else. I wonder how many people brought all of those things into 2014 with them. Some old baggage and allowed those things to really affect their outlook on life. For some people, maybe it's some things that had been said to them or about them not just years ago, but decades ago. But they're not going to let it go. So they entered into a new year bringing with them those burdens and those heartaches from the past. Believe it or not, some Christians have never gotten over the fact that maybe God did not give them a specific answer to the prayer that they had been praying. God gave them an answer, but his answer wasn't what they wanted to hear. And instead of thanking God for the response and now moving on with your life to see what does he have for me, there's a lot of Christians that pout when they don't get their way through prayer. You may know some of them. I have in my lifetime. For a lot of Christians, they have never gotten over the fact that a church or a pastor may have disappointed them sometime in the past. They've carried that baggage around for years. And as a result, they're a little skeptical of any other church they go into or any other pastor that they may set under, all because of what happened decades ago. Decades ago. I actually know people who have carried around heartaches, scars, emotional scars, and really been gladly to show them to anyone who would ask about things that were done to them years and years and years ago. People that were told, you're too ugly, you're too overweight, you're too lazy, you're too stupid, you're too clumsy, you're too unpopular, you're too poor, you're too skinny, you're so shy, whatever, and those personal comments from really jealous and bitter people have haunted folks for most of their adult life. I probably told you this, but it was less than 10 years ago I was back for a class reunion in Michigan, and a fellow that I just went to school with my entire life, kindergarten up through graduation, his name is Brian Peacock, good guy. Uh, Brian wasn't a nerd, but Brian was one of those that would have given any anything for just a little bit of athletic ability. Is my mic down now? 
Okay. Brian had no really athletic ability the way you would think most do. And he worked very hard. But he was able to make the football team and the basketball team and the baseball team. He's a little better baseball player than he was the other two, but he kind of sat the bench for all of those times. Well, Mark would know the guys I'm talking about, the guys that work hard and practice and are there just as much as anyone else. The ones you need on the bench or the sidelines who are encouraging the other players who have that positive attitude. You ever seen the movie Rudy? Kind of the Rudy's of the world, you know? That was Brian. He was also in the band. He played the baritone, and I was played the trombone, and Brian and I got along great. But he took a lot of teasing in school. And at that class reunion, his wife had to leave early, and I told Brian I would take him home. So I drove Brian home. You know what we talked about on the way home? Things that people had said to Brian in high school. He's a grown man over 50 years old, and he was still wanting to show me the scars of things that had been said to him or about him that he was still carrying. Brian's not alone. There are a lot of people I know who carry that baggage around year after year after year. I want to talk about that this morning and this amazing resolution I think we all need to make. You know, if you're going to preach a sermon like this, there are some very typical great verses that I guess preachers could normally use to frame this kind of a message. Uh, most are written by the Apostle Paul under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. I want to look at those real quickly and then get to what I'm going to use as my text today. But it's in Philippians, the third chapter, to where the Apostle Paul says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended or made it. But this one thing I do, you know, we get a lot about the character and the personality of the Apostle Paul in the Scriptures, and it's a wonderful picture that we get of him. But his, he's writing this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He says, I really haven't made it, but there's one thing I'm really good at. There's one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. Listen, if Paul couldn't put those things behind him after the first shipwreck, he would have never got on the second one, okay? <laughs> he was good at putting the past behind him. And he said, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. There's great verses of Scripture there, Christian, for you to kind of mark in your Bible and to memorize and to apply to your life. That's good. You ought to have short memories. I'm going to talk about it. Hebrews tells us in the 12th chapter, it says, Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside, let, lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Runners do not like to run with weights anything that ties them down. If you were uh, at my birthday party a Sunday night ago, uh, and there were some pictures up there, one with me running cross country in high school, I used to not run with shoes. I used to put four, four pair of socks on and then tape the bottom of my feet and everything because it was cross country. We were running through some creeks and things. And my shoes, my, my Chuck Taylors got wet. Man, it was hard to run. So uh, I didn't run them. Uh, I, I did not want to be tied down with anything. Christian, how in the world can we live our life when we are carrying weights that we should not be carrying, trying to run with patience that race that the Lord has set before us? Uh, Paul says you just can't do it. You've got to lay aside those things. I like what he writes in 2 Timothy, the fourth chapter. He says, for I am now ready to be offered. This is really the last letter that he was writing before he was uh, beheaded. He says, for I am now ready to be offered in the time of my departure at hand. I like the way he writes that. My departure is at hand. He says, I fought a good fight. Paul was not passive, all right? Paul went to Peter face to face when they had a problem. He couldn't wait to get there. Paul had some energy to him about his faith. He said, I fought a good fight. I finished my course and I've kept the faith. 
He said, henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me on that day. And not me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Those are good things when you think about characteristics we should apply to our life on how we should live. Make sure you do everything you do as under the Lord. You fight that good fight. Keep your faith in the process and be able to finish your course. Don't quit. Those are great verses. They could frame what I'm going to share with you this morning very well. But I want to consider some other verses this morning which will tell us about the character of the greatest king Israel ever had. Because what I believe we could learn from and about King David and about his life, especially as he gets at the end of it, I think can help all of us move forward in our own life. Now, 1 Kings, we're going to start there, and then we're going to go to 1 Chronicles, the 28th verse. But I want us to read this first verse as we start. It says, now King David was old and stricken in years, and they covered him with clothes, but he got no heat. In the King James Version, it says, got no heat, and he got no heat. It's the same thing, all right? Can you picture that in your mind, what that verse is describing? He was old, stricken in years. The Word of God will tell us he's 70 years old. 70 years old. And his body was so breaking down, he could not keep himself warm. The old heart wasn't pumping the way it should. Nothing was working the way it should. And they had to cover him to try to keep him warm. Now let me ask you to think about something this morning. When you think about David and you hear his name mentioned, what usually comes to your mind is that picture you have of David. Really, what what comes to your mind? What do you see when you think about this apple of God's eye? Do you see him when you hear David? Do you think about a young boy as a shepherd? Do you think about David as being that very skillful writer of songs and that skilled musician? The Word of God says he's a handsome man. When you hear the word David, do you think of this young, handsome, good-looking guy? Do you see David as that fearless teenager standing before that nine-foot-tall great warrior Goliath? Is that what you see in your mind when you hear the word David? Do you see him as that handsome, rich, and powerful playboy who allowed his personal lust to overcome what he knew was the true word commands of God? And in the result of forgetting that, he committed two horrible sins— Is that what you see in your mind when you hear the word David? Maybe you see when you hear the word David, him dancing as they're bringing the Ark of the Covenant back finally to Jerusalem. And he is leading the parade, dancing and singing so much that his wife sees him and she's mad saying, look at him making a fool of himself down there. Is that the David you see in your mind's eye? Do you see him as that great warrior leading those wonderful mighty men that Scripture gives us the names of into battle once again? I'm not sure how you see David today, but I'm almost positive that few of any people in here today when you hear the name David think of him as a broken down old man stricken in years who can't even keep himself warm. He's on the verge of death. I don't think that's how we want to remember David, is it? We want to remember him as something else. But here is the former shepherd, the the giant killer, the handsome king, the fearless warrior, the man after God's own heart, and he is about to die. And may I say, I think prematurely, 70 is not that old, especially since I just turned 60. I mean, 70 is not that old, all right? Benny, I still want to be beating those young guys in golf tournaments, you know, 10 years from now. I have great pleasure in it. As long as you keep hitting that long ball, all right, we'll be in good shape. 70 is not that old, especially when you look at the Word of God. 
And here David at the age of 70, he's going to die at the age of 70. And here we find him well stricken. Well, with that in your mind, if you go to 1 Chronicles, the 28th chapter, David's about to give his last charge to his son Solomon and to the people that are gathered in Israel that have so faithfully followed him over his 40 years as reign of the king of Israel. And for this man that in his lifetime God had to severely discipline due to his sin, which he did, the man who had really not gotten everything he had prayed for, by the way, God had told him no on more than one occasion. I think we can learn something from these verses of Scripture about how to live our life and how to move into especially a new year from the character of David. And I want you to read beginning in the second verse of Chronicles 28 chapter. It says, Then King David stood up upon his feet. I think that's an important line there. It tells you how physically ill and sick and feeble he was. The fact that he was able to stand upon his own feet gets recognition in the word of God. He stood upon his feet and said, Hear me, my brethren and my people. As for me, I had in mine heart to build a house of rest for the ark of the covenant of the Lord and for the footstool of our God and had made ready for the building. This man, the apple of God's eye, his desire was a good, godly desire to really build what we would call the temple. And he began to make preparations for that in a variety of ways. But in verse 3, David says, But God said unto me, God gave him an answer. Thou shalt not build a house for my name, because thou hast been a man of war and hast shed blood. Now how many people, when you pray, and you don't get what you want, how? And say, well, that's not good enough. You know, or maybe when you don't get your answer, you manipulate the result anyways and end up paying for it months or years later. David, this wonderful man after God's own heart, had prayed. He had a desire for something, and God said, I'm not going to let you do it, and here's why. Now, instead of pouting about that, now look what David goes on to talk about here in these next verses. God said, no, but how be it? The Lord God of Israel chose me before all the house of my father to be king over Israel forever. He is now going to be start listing the blessings of God upon his life. Because he's not going to carry that baggage with him, even into eternity. He said, God said, you're going to be king over Israel forever, for he hath chosen Judah to be the ruler of the house of Judah, the house of my father, and among the sons of my father, he liked me to make me king over all Israel. And of all my sons, for the Lord hath given me many sons, he hath chosen Solomon, my son, to set upon the throne of the kingdom of the Lord over Israel. You can kind of get a sense of just pride and excitement that he gets as we read that. Look at the next verses. And he said unto me, Solomon thy son, he shall build my house and my courts. For I have chosen him to be my son, and I will be his father. Dads, wouldn't you like to hear that said about your children? Knowing that you have lived your life in the fullest and the right way, and your departure's at hand, you know you're ready to die, go into eternity, and to know that the Lord has chosen your child Lord's going to be the father to yours. I think that's just a tender verse when you stop and just take time to read it. He chosen him to be my son and I will be his father. Moreover, God said, I'm going to establish his kingdom forever. If, okay, circle that if. If he be constant to do my commandments and my judgments as at this day. Now therefore, in the sight of all Israel, the congregation of the Lord, and in the audience of God, I like that. All of the people are gathered it's like God's watching. He's in the audience watching this. Keep and seek for all the commandments of the Lord your God. He's talking to Solomon now. David is that you may possess this good land and leave it for an inheritance for your children after you forever. And thou, my, and thou Solomon, my son, know thou the God of thy father and serve him 
with a perfect heart. You've got to know him first before you can serve him. And with a willing mind, for the Lord searcheth all hearts and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. If thou seek him, he will be found of thee. But if thou forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. Do you have any idea how many people are disabled over what someone has said to them or about them? Physically, they're not handicapped, but emotionally, they are. Emotionally, they are all because of some negative words someone has spoken about them. For a lot of people, they really don't have to hear anything in order to get disabled. We call them ultra-sensitive. Let someone drop a few pounds, put on some new clothes or a new dress, get their hair done, and if no one notices, they get disabled for a few days, don't they? Can you believe? No one even said that. I look like I did. No one noticed. It's amazing what can happen to some people that will disable them and get their mind on something that it should not be on. How many people do you know stay mad because they did not get their way? And they never seem to forget about it. They always remember it. They've been carrying that baggage along for a long time. Been in church my whole life. That happens more in church than it probably does anyplace else. And people remember, I don't know why the church ever decided to do that. Or why they wanted to do this. I'm not talking about in the last five years. You've been wonderfully supportive. In my time in church, I've seen it, and you have too. That people never seem to forget certain things, and they carry that around. They're disabled by it. Almost 30 years ago, we were living in Fredericksburg, Virginia. And it was there that we went to Spotswood Baptist Church. And the pastor there was Bob Melman. He was a little guy, but he seemed seven foot tall. You talk about someone thundering from the pulpit. Bob Melvin did it. And the Sunday that Cindy and I joined there, hon, I, I'm, the whole church was full, wasn't it, up front? There had to be over 20 other families and people that joined the church or got saved that same Sunday morning. It was amazing what God was doing in that church under Brother Bob Melvin in Fredericksburg, Virginia. We were probably 800 plus running. It was just a sweet place to be. We weren't there very long. So at that church, Brother Bob approached me and he asked me, he said, to be considered to be ordained to become a deacon. I was ordained that Sunday evening with Dick Bills. You remember some of the other guys, some of my good buddies? And to begin serving there as a deacon. And I think, I, I, I don't think I know. I know things that I learned there. Serving as a deacon and watching Brother Bob's life we're all in preparation for what I've been doing. It really is. Bob was a tremendous friend of mine, he and his wife. And so after I became ordained, the church was had their upcoming annual business meeting. And there were just a handful of people in this large church that were creating a lot of problems for the pastor. And they wanted the budget to be itemized in a way to where Bob Melvin, Gene Willis, Stone, everyone down there, the secretary was, here's what, that person makes this person, this person, this person, this person. And Bob said, when that happens, there's going to be someone in church who doesn't care what any of the staff makes as long as it's not a dollar more than what they make. And it's going to create problems in this church. And Bob was right. And so Bob said, I want you, Kevin, to present our budget for the next year. How do you suggest we do it? And I said, I think we put one light on it, Bob. And if anyone in the church wants to know what you or anyone else may think, go talk to the deacons and we'll be happy to tell them. Nothing will be hidden. So I had the privilege <laughs> of presenting that to the church. Last week we got Carol Melvin's card. Bob passed away probably six years ago. We went up to his funeral. Uh, cancer and passed away. I cannot tell you what a good friend Bob Melvin was to me. Went up there, but we got Carol's Christmas card, and she got our card. She commented about Luke and the grandbaby. And you know the last thing she wrote in her card? I showed her to Cindy. We both laughed. She says, by the way, we still just have one line item in the budget. <laughs> one line item in the budget. And when I read that, you know what I read? I read that 
the stress that had been placed on the ministry of that church and the people were so overwhelming, I didn't even realize it. And some 30 years later, the wife of Bob still remembers it. And I thought, how many people that maybe were trying to stir that up because the church now is well over 2,000 people. When we moved down here, they built a new building. The ministry there has been unbelievable. But there were some people there who did not get their way, who were trying to carry that baggage. And I thought, how in the world, why do you want to live your life like that? Christian, get rid of those things. Don't carry them with you that will disable you emotionally. Because it will affect, affect your spiritual life also. Don't worry about what someone says or what they think or all those other things. Worry about what he thinks. Do what he expects. Do you realize that if you go to Greenfield Village in Dearborn, Michigan, they have Thomas Edison's home where he grew up there as part of the Greenfield Village. You see a lot of things. But one of the most interesting things you'll see there is what one of his elementary teachers wrote about Thomas Edison. He's too stupid to learn anything. 1,100 patents later, who got the last laugh, okay? <laughs> Thomas Edison, that's what an elementary teacher wrote about him. Walt Disney was fired as a cartoonist by a Kansas City newspaper and was told he lacked imagination. <laughs> you go down to Disney, you need to go to the MGM studio section, you could see an unbelievable kind of 20-minute video on the life of Walt Disney and amazing. Yeah, he lacked imagination. On three separate occasions, the University of Southern California's cinematic arts program rejected the application of Steven Spielberg. <laughs> three times he submitted it. Three times he was rejected by it. Harlan Sanders was fired from six jobs before he started his own local restaurant, which became Kentucky Fried Chicken. You may not recognize his name. His name is Theodore Geisel. He wrote a children's book, and the first 27 publishers he took it to said, we don't want to touch it. Now, I don't know how many doors you would have knocked on before you would have said, ah, 10's enough, 15. I can't take more than 20 rejections. 27 publishers said no to his children's book. He kept going. One said, yes, you know him today as Dr. Zeus, and that book was The Cat in the Hat. His sophomore and junior year in high school, this guy played on the junior varsity basketball team. He only played one year of high school varsity basketball and is probably the greatest basketball player we'll ever see, Michael Jordan. One year of varsity basketball was all Dean Smith needed to see. And the rest is history. Listen, great achievers don't carry excess baggage around very long about failures, about what people think about them, about what people have said about them. That's why rockets don't have rear view mirrors. Can you imagine how silly that would be for the designers designing a rocket and say, someone would say, well, you missed something. Where are the rear view mirrors here? Why do you need them? If all you're going to do is propel and go forward. High performing businesses are great at learning from the past, which make them better in the future. What I have learned, though, in my professional business life is that most companies are very good at performing what I call autopsies. Ben will know what I'm talking about here. They're very good at taking information after it's already happened and doing an autopsy, and, but they're very poor at using it to make decisions to make the company a whole lot better. you got to be careful how you handle those things. Sam Walton, one of the things that made Walmart great, by the way, they used to have Saturday morning meetings at 9 o'clock. And on Saturday morning, they would take their sales results, gather from their stores and see what was selling at high-performing items. They would make the decision in those Saturday morning meetings, and by Monday, all of the Walmart stores would have made those changes. 
Rocket ships don't have rear view mirrors. Christian, what do you carry with you year after year after year that weighs you down? We were playing Scranton University in a Christmas tournament and uh, in the championship game, and I missed my first six shots. And I'll never forget this. Time out. Coach's chin looked like it was out to here. And, I go, oh. and uh, we got over there, and he began yelling and screaming at the other four starters. Not saying a word, not even looking at them. Yelling and screaming at them because they had not been getting me the ball where I needed to get it, and it was their fault. Now, I just missed six in a row. And he's chewing these guys out. Well, and the official blew the whistle, trying to get back on the floor, and I started going and grabbed him. He pulled me back. He said, if you get another ball past you and pass it, I'm setting you on the bench for the rest of the game. Shoot the ball. Now, you know what all that did? I didn't think about those six misses. They were the last thing on my mind. I didn't want to be on that bench for the rest of the game, and I knew he was serious. I missed two more shots that game, scored 39 points. We beat Scranton University. But I learned a lesson that day. You can't think about the misses. You can't think about the missed opportunities. You can't think about the bad decisions. You better learn from them and correct them and not try to replicate them again. But you had better go forward. When someone says, I don't think you're smart enough for the job, well, that's your opinion. But right now, I'm in it. Well, you know, you're not good looking enough, you're not handsome enough, you're not a good enough speaker, you know, people aren't going to do this. Uh, listen, that's all from people who are jealous about your life and what you're doing, and they're trying to let that jealous, jealousness turn into bitterness so that it'll cripple you and you'll carry that around with you. Don't let it happen, Christian. Don't let it happen. Don't go into this next year, don't get into it tomorrow carrying any of that stuff with you. Listen, instead of focusing on the times that God had disciplined him, David just remembered the blessing. Look, man, God, you chose me. You let me lead your people, Israel. Man, now look what you've done. You've selected my son. And David's focused, David's focused on what God had done for him. Not about all of the difficulties that come with leading. God had blessed David. He had blessed his leadership, his reign over God's people. He had allowed Solomon now to, to be the successor to the throne. And God also allowed David, when you keep reading, to have a very important role of all of the furniture and artifacts and utensils that were going to go in to occupy that temple after his son Solomon built it. David still had a hand in that. Christian, if every one of us had a short memory, Think about how great life would be. Right. No one thought I was going to go to college. Neither did my brother. When we were growing up and when we lost our dad, the last thing in the world, how are you going to afford to go to college? We actually had people try to tell us to get into a trade school or something like that. And do a, Well, we ended up going to college. David Wergo stood here in 2010 when we were supporting Dave uh, overseas and from Flat Rock, Michigan. My brother was here that night. I'll never forget it. He looked at Ken and I said, can you believe Flat Rock, Michigan? <laughs> I mean, who would have thought all of that? Listen, if you want to believe what someone's going to tell you about what they think is your lack of abilities, your lack of skills, all that kind of stuff, you don't live in the right house, your parents don't make enough money, you didn't go to the right school, any of that sort of stuff. I'm proud I went to Geneva College. I spent two weeks at Harvard uh, when I was in business. I was there when we went from Desert Shield to Desert Storm. I kind of got stranded in Boston. But you know what I found out after two weeks of Harvard? I got just as good of an education at Geneva College, is what I found, for a lot less money. <laughs> for a lot less money. Don't let someone discourage you, Christian, not only about your life and what they may think you don't have and your characteristics, but about where you go to church. Don't be ashamed to tell people where you go to church. Don't be ashamed to tell people about the spirit of the Lord moving in this place and lives that are being changed. Don't carry that type of baggage with you. Dementia is a bad thing, but we all need to get a little bit of it. We all need to get a little bit of it and forget about those things that have happened to us over the course of our life. 
and kind of wipe it clean and start afresh. And if you could do that, think about how much better your life would be. I can't walk over there because I may pass that person. I don't want to talk to him anymore, Joe, so I'm going to kind of hang over here. You're not going to believe what that person said about me way back then. Uh, I can't. You know, it, on and on, think about how much better your life would be. Listen, people can say whatever they want to say about me. I know who I am, what I do, and why I do it. More importantly, my Heavenly Father knows, and past that, my family knows. Really, outside of that, I don't care what people think. And I really never have. <laughs> I really never have. Uh, so if people lay awake at night thinking, how can I bother Kevin Creesman? That's not going to be one of them. All right? Because I really don't care. He knows. He searches the hearts. That's what we read. He, he sees what's there. He sees what's in yours, too. And what he must think about when he sees us day after day, year after year, making all sorts of resolutions and pulling with us some stuff that we should have discarded years ago. Christian, that's what we need to do. David did it. He said, hey, I didn't get my way there, but so what? Look what all that God has done for me. I'll close with this. This has kind of been more of a motivational message, I guess, than anything else for you today. Because I know, I have seen grown executive men and women handling large responsibilities set in front of me and talk about things that happened in their life years before and were as devastated in front of me as probably they had been when it happened. I go, how in the world can you live your life like that? young lady was being interviewed by all the media outlets. She had just been crowned Miss Universe. But you know what she talked about? She talked about a letter that she intercepted in high school from the popular guy that he was writing to a friend of his. And then the letter talked about how ugly she was, how unpopular she was, the clothes she wore and the family that she had wasn't doing very well financially. And as a teenage high school girl, she intercepted that note. And now being crowned 10 years later as Miss Universe, in the interview process with the media, she was talking about that letter. I guess the contest that's to say she's the most beautiful woman in the world. The most beautiful woman in the world is thinking about what was said about her some 10 years earlier from a guy who they thought was popular. Yeah. Now, as silly as that sounds, we've probably got a large majority of people in a church our size that will remember something if you were to be honest with yourself that maybe someone said to you as an elementary student or junior high, high school, maybe it's sometime early in your life. Maybe your spouse said something out of anger that cuts so deep, you say, I'm never going to get over that one. A lot of children have that happen to them, by the way, by moms and dads. Your moms and dads say hard, hurtful things, and they forget about them, and the kids grow up and never seem to forget about them. Christian, we ought to live our life. I read it in those verses before we got to David. We ought to forget those things that are behind. Do you agree with that? I mean, you know, you can't do anything. I can't, I can't change those things. I could learn from them. I could grow from them. I could be better for them. But if I'm going to let it disable me in working today and tomorrow and serving the Lord, that's crazy. Listen, you were made in his image and his likeness. I don't care what anyone says, you were made in the image of God. And Christian, the Holy Spirit of God is living inside of you your heavenly father everything you see he created and spoke it into existence and Christian one day when your departure is at hand as mine is you know what we have to look forward to eternity in heaven streets of gold mansions it's an amazing thing so why let some things today they're tools of Satan they really are to try to discourage us and pull us back and to slow us down Instead of running that race with patience. I want you to stand. I want to go into every day of my life.
doing everything I can, man. I want to run that race. I want to be stretching toward the tape when my departure set the end. I really do. That's how I want to go. I think that's how you should want to go, too. You may say, ah, Pastor, you don't know what someone said to me. Hey, listen, I've had all sorts of things said about me. I've walked into places and been booed. <laughs> Went into one place to play a basketball game. They'd made these sticks about this long and painted the top red. And when they announced my, introduced me, they all stood up and broke them and started throwing them at me and everything else. I liked it. <laughs> I liked it. You know, it didn't bother me a bit. Don't let things bother you. Kind of have that mental dementia. Get rid of all those things. Go on to serve your Heavenly Father with joy and fervor this year. And uh, I believe that we are in for maybe one of the greatest years that this church may have ever had. I really believe that. Okay? And we all got to be running. Okay? If it's, if, if it's a tug of war, we can't have two or three people not holding on to the rope. We all got to be latched on to it, doing our part. But I can't wait to see what God is going to do here in this place this year. I saw what he's done this year, and I still can't believe it. But Christian, we just got to get rid of those things, okay? So can today, can you do something for me and with me? Just say, Lord, we're going to pray. We're just going to get rid of all this stuff. Do not let that come to my mind again. Whatever it is. For some people I know. I was part of a church and I got, I've been hurt in a church before. Those are hard to get over. When you're hurt by someone in a church environment. I'm honest with you right now. Church environments are more harsh on individuals than a business environment will ever be. They really are. But you know what? Get over those. Let God take care of those situations. He will. <laughs> Probably already has, okay? Just get rid of them. Say, Lord, this morning I'm going to pray and say, just get all of this stuff behind me. I'm going to live new right now, new thought, new mind process, new heart, all of those types of things. And I'll guarantee you that your outlook and your, your life is going to be completely different than you've ever experienced. Our Father, I thank you, Lord, for this wonderful, uh, holy inspired book that you've given us. Lord, this wonderful man, this man after your own heart, Lord, who had such a roller coaster life through many early years. And Father, here is still praising you and worshiping you, Lord, not bitter, not pouting, not distressed over the things that had taken place in his life. But Father, excited about the future of his people for his son and his own future that he'd be with you in eternity. Lord, I ask and pray. Lord, you know all of our hearts today. Father, you understand and search every heart. And Lord, I would ask and pray for each person today as I have been preaching this morning. Lord, I am positive that we've all been maybe reliving to a degree or thinking about things like that that we've been carrying. Lord, I would ask and pray that with all sincerity and believing, Lord, that you could do it, that we would pray today. And Father, I ask you to forgive us for harboring those things, for allowing them to restrict us in doing your will and your way. And Father, pray and ask you to remove those thoughts from our mind, those, those burdens from our hearts. And Father, that we could all leave this place today afresh and anew, Lord, excited for what you have with us. Lord, I thank you and love you and praise you for what you're doing here and for these wonderful people. Lord, I am excited about tomorrow and the days ahead because I know your control of everything. Lord, I pray that you would bless this time of invitation now, for it's in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. I'm going to sing just two verses of this song. I love it. It says, I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to
last verse we'll be through. This last verse says, The cross before me. going to make two announcements and then we will uh, have a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed but uh, no evening service tonight okay so uh, through the holidays and everything no evening service tonight I'm so glad you're here this morning and uh, it's been a good service next Sunday we're on our back to our regular church routine routine Sunday school 10 o'clock morning service evening service but on our evening service we're going to have Karen Peck and New River this is a great 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 group of, uh, of people uh, two sisters and a, uh, another contracted singer with them, and uh, they will bless your heart. They really will. They've been doing this a long time, and a uh, very popular, famous group. They will be, uh, we'll have the sign up all week, and I know with the advertising that's done through the Southern Gospel Singing News and other things in their website, there will be a lot of folks here next Sunday night. So uh, we'll remind you next Sunday morning, but you want to get here early, get your seat, make sure you can uh, welcome visitors and all those sorts of things. We'll need some help with the parking. I know. Uh, uh, you know, we're about 270 people and our parking lot is full. So if we fill this place out next Sunday night, which we probably will come close to, if we don't, uh, we may be stacking cars out there. I don't know. So we'll need some help with that. But that's what we have uh, going on the announcement wise. I want you to have a safe week, really uh, have a wonderful week, have a happy new year. And will you do, you, did you, did, did everyone pray and say, Lord, will you get this stuff off my mind? All right, Benny Clark will know the next time we play golf, if I pull out a club at a certain hole in Albany, Georgia, Benny, you'll know that I haven't swept that out of my mind yet, but uh, uh, clear our minds. Get that stuff out of there, okay? We're going to have a word of prayer. We'll be dismissed. Give us time, Mark and Kathy. You guys get back there. Cindy and I will work our way. Our Father, I thank you for this wonderful day that we could be here in your house, Lord, for the privilege it is to present and to preach this gospel of Jesus Christ. I thank you so much for it. Lord, I ask and pray that you would clean our hearts, clean our minds, Lord, and get us excited about what you're doing and what you are going to do. Father, for those that are traveling, uh, even from our uh, congregation today, I pray you'd bless them, those that are sick. Father, you'd heal and restore them and raise them back up. For those that will be leaving today and the next days, Lord, I pray that you would give them a wonderful time away, bring them back safely. But Lord, it has been good to be in your house. Father, we're so thankful for this year that you've given us. Lord, we're looking forward to what you have for us this next year. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.